Hello and welcome to Ultraviolet Network's Use Case Explorer. I'm Matt Sharif, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at terminating SSL VPN to a loopback interface. So why would you want to pin SSL VPN to a loopback as opposed to letting it let those connections terminate in on a um, physical WAN interface? The primary reason is that you get additional flexibility versus local in policies, which number one are CLI only. So those tend to be out of sight, out of mind. We forget about those. I have a number of instances where I've had customers come to me and ask, hey, dude, I've got this huge issue. I have no idea what's causing it. And then we go through the steps and we're doing a, spending quite a bit of time troubleshooting only to realize we have local in policies that are blocking the traffic. Two, you get additional flexibility with the 40 OS policy set since it's true traversing the FortiGate as opposed to terminating on the FortiGate. So we'll get additional visibility and uh, filtering capability, whether it's AV, IPS, or just control over the source destination IP addresses um, versus local in policy. Assumptions for this uh, video are that you have access, admin access to a FortiGate or can get admin access. Enough slideware, let's get to the fun stuff. So once you get logged into your FortiGate, we're going to go down and double check our VPN settings. I'm pretty sure I have an SSL VPN service running on this because I've used a VDI desktop that I have in this particular environment uh, to in previous videos. So let's just go double check those settings real quick. And sure enough, I have WAN 1 and WAN 2 in there. What I want to do is I want to really migrate this configuration from this WAN 1 WAN 2 to the loopback interface. So the first step we need to do is actually create a loopback interface. And the way we do that is we go to Network, Interfaces, Create New Interface. And then from there, we can specify the interface type. In this case, loopback interface. We could call it SSL VPN pin or whatever you want to call it, really. And we can give it an IP address that... Um, isn't necessarily routable within our uh, infrastructure. It can be. It doesn't really matter. In this case, I'm just going to give it uh, 10. Dot, let's see, 101.0.1, and it's a slash 32 because it's a uh, loopback address. And we'll make it pingable. That's about it. We don't even need to do that much. And okay, perfect. So 10.101.0.1. That's a sir. That's our SSL VPN pin. And now I need, since we're coming in via one of the WAN interfaces to this SSL VPN um, interface, we need to create a VIP object, a virtual IP address. And where we do that is we create a virtual IP um, under policy and objects and virtual IPs. I've already got one VIP there. That's for the VDI device I spoke of earlier. I'm going to create a new virtual IP. And we can say, hey, it can come in over inner interface, or you can actually pin it to an interface. The external IP address, if you are a dynamic uh, IP address recipient, this you need to be careful with this. You need to add some sort of dynamic DNS or something to this. And then you also need to add some port filtering. Depending on how you choose and what port you choose to pin SSL VPN on, this is a subject of larger debate, and we're not going to get into this in this video. Um, you may need a port filter. You may not. For instance, I prefer port 443 for SSL VPN. Why? Because if I'm somewhere public and I need to v, uh, VPN back in, I know that port 443 and 80 are both going to be permitted. Not everywhere that has public Wi-Fi is going to permit uh, port 8443 or port 10443. My point is, is just be mindful of the port you use. Ultimately, that is a decision that you and your organization need to make. In this case, I'm, I've got some static IPs I can use, so I'll use, um, I'll go ahead and uh, put my external IP address here. One, let's say that. And we'll map that to our internal 10.101.0.1. And if you wanted to add some uh, port forwarding, like I said, if you had a dynamic IP or just a single external IP address, you could go ahead and 
map your external ports uh, here. Let's say you had to move 443 to something else. You could say, okay, uh, 8443 to internal 443. Again, it doesn't matter from the perspective of the SSL VPN process because at this point we're controlling the mapping here. So the SSL VPN process can always listen on 443 and you can choose to control what port it wants. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and use this for now, and we should be okay. Oh. <clears throat> and I will give it a name. Not VAP. That's a virtual AP. VIP. Okay, perfect. Last but not least, we need to build a policy to allow from the external to the, int, uh, to the loopback. And the way that's going to look is it's going to look something like this. SSL VPN and incoming interface is going to be the ISP underlay. I have SD-WAN deployed on this device, so I'm using an SD-WAN zone. That will include uh, uh, WAN 1 and WAN 2. And then the outgoing interface is going to be our loopback. The source, now this is where you can get a lot more creative. You can use address groups, you can use internet services, you can use uh, geo logins, uh, whatever you want. In this case, I'm going to create an address object and we can call it, oh, it's going to be a geo address object and it's going to be United States. Now, this isn't going to protect me against everything because any compromised device in the United States can still try to break in. So um, let's not be under any illusions here that, okay, only US-based addresses were safe. No. All right, great. So, but I am limiting what can reach my device. The destination is going to be uh, the VIP, the VIP. And then the service, in this case, because I know it's only HTTPS, I'm only going to allow HTTPS. Uh, we are not going to NAT because if we do NAT, everything will look like it's coming from the uh, from the loopback IP address. And then, um, sure, let's do some antivirus, some IPS. We'll just do the default and uh, certificate inspection is good for now. Uh, we can log all sessions. So right now, we get a lot more flexibility than what we could get. Previously, you know, here's the cool thing is you could actually, if you had a threat feed that you managed or that you subscribe to, you could actually create a deny rule to that, which is something you can't do in the um, local end policies. So that's just something to keep in mind as to one of the reasons why we do this. Okay, lovely. Um, so this SSL VPN in is going to be coming from anywhere in the U.S., Destination is the VIP, as you can see. And then the only service we're going to allow is HTTPS. Now we need to go back to our SSL VPN service. I've already got my SSL VPN um, access. So the way I'm going to test this is I'm going to test this using the web portal. It should work the same way, whether it's tunnel or web-based. And I'm going to go down to VPN. And... Instead of WAN 1 and WAN 2, I am going to add the loopback. I'm going to listen here. Okay. There we go. And it will be listening at this. Now, just to be sure, I have an IP address that corresponds ping vpn.ultraviolet.network. There we go. It corresponds to the public IP address that we configured. Okay, perfect. All right, so now we'll go HTTPS colon whack whack vpn.ultraviolet.network. Got to click apply and therefore that will never work. Try that one more time. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So something just dawned on me. I, if you remember, the ping resolved to a dot four. Meanwhile, our address we created here is a dot eight. So um, we need to go ahead and go back and fix that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and fix that in my DNS resolution. What I can do here is if I did HTTPS colon whack whack. Uh, you'll see that it actually comes up. So I'm going to go fix my DNS resolution real quick and I'll be right back. And through the magic of video editing, we've gone ahead and corrected that DNS entry. So let's go ahead and ping VPN the ultraviolet network. And as you can see, dot eight resolves. It's not going to ping because our policy only allows HTTPS and that's okay. Good enough, we'll close this out and let's actually go to whack whack and VP and ultraviolet network. Here is our login screen. And here is our remote desktop client. Now you may recall this desktop from some of our Fortis Sassy sessions if you watch those. If not, I encourage you to check those out. There's some really cool use cases um, surrounding uh, uh, remote access. Um, but to recap, let's see what we did. So we started off with WAN 1 and WAN 2 in these inter in the listen on interfaces. However, we've gone ahead and um, changed this. <clears throat> we've uh, created the loopback interface, right? assigned it an IP address not in use elsewhere within the network. We went ahead and created a virtual IP, aka a VIP. And from there, we created the policy to allow from the WAN interface. In this case, since I'm using SD-WAN zones, it's going to allow from the ISP underlay zone into, which includes the WAN, at least the WAN 1 interface, um, to the SSL VPN pin. And then we went back and removed WAN 1 and 2 from SSL VPN and added our loopback in there. We did not have to uh, get rid of our SSL VPN policy or make any changes to that. However, if you are setting this up new, you will need to uh, create a policy. Otherwise, you'll never get the login screen. And that covers it for pinning the SSL VPN service to a loopback interface. I'd like to thank you for watching. I hope this has been helpful. I do want to take a moment and recognize and thank you all for really helping uh, Ultraviolet Networks uh, and the content, helping drive the content. It's been a really crazy year for us, really, and uh, look forward to doing more of these for you in the new year. Happy New Year to you all. Madman out.